I'd like to talk a little bit about something that I've been thinking rather a lot about lately, and that's the role of myths in martial arts, particularly um, the kind of martial arts I teach, Chinese martial arts, have a lot of mythology associated with them. And we're living in the 21st century, it's the MMA era where the techniques are tested rigorously, scientifically, we have sports science in training, um, there's a much more understanding of the history of the styles and the systems and what really happened and how much is myth and legend and so on. So it's an interesting question, do these old stories still have any value? And the martial arts world, in fact, the world generally now seems to be very polarised. You have on one extreme people who are almost deluded and practice in a, in, in a very unrealistic sense and on the other hand the people who are hyper rational and think that uh, some of the old stuff doesn't have value or some of the stories don't have value either because they've been historically debunked or scientifically debunked etc and I'm always interested in uh, what were these stories designed to teach what's the lessons here are they still useful are they still relevant and um, the more I practice, the more I think, yes, they, they really are, and they really are relevant and they still are useful. So I'll take a couple of examples of some of the myths from, uh, one from the Tibetan Lama style and one from the Shaolin Gong Fu, explain the myth, and then my interpretation, and again, this is just my interpretation. I've been practicing 35 years, um, and so I have some of my own experience and insights, but it may mean different things to different people. So I'd be really interested if you have any of your own ideas, your own suggestions, drop it in the comments. I'll be happy to engage and discuss. I say this is just a, a thought process, a working work in process. So let's start with um, one of the Hapgar creation myths. That is the white crane of the Lama style. was said to be Adato, who was a uh, Tibetan Lama, was meditating one day and he saw uh, his, his meditation was disturbed by some noise. And when he looked, there's a mother crane uh, protecting her nest from, a, from an ape. And the ape's trying to uh, get the eggs and the mother cranes protecting them and as Adato watched he noticed that the, the crane used a lot of shifting evasive movements evasive footwork and eventually using uh, her reach and her long her long wings and then her beak and eventually plucked the eye of the uh, ape and the ape run off screaming and so the the crane won and Adato was said to have been inspired by that to create a martial art based on um, movement on invasion on getting a, an advantageous position attacking the vital points and that was the basis for what became the lion's roar later Hapgar uh, white crane and so on so it's an interesting story um, did it happen probably not uh, but what what's it meant to be teaching what's it actually saying so it's interesting it's an interesting story and it occurred to me that it's almost the same story of David and Goliath in, in the Western culture. We have um, a shepherd who defeats a big, big fellow using a slingshot. What's, what's the similarity? A shepherd's protecting the flock. The mother crane's protecting her nest. So we first have this idea, it's about protection, it's about defence. It's not about offence, it's not about making trouble, it's about defending yourself. Um, fighting for some people, protecting something you believe in. So that's the first thing. Uh, there's lots of also myths in the West as well about mothers lifting cars off their children you know, when they're trapped under a car because they get superhuman strength when they're protecting their, their young. It's something that they value, it's something that means something, it's finding something to fight for, something that uh, you can channel your energy into. So that's one idea. What's another idea? The, the motion of the, the crane was evasion. It didn't fight force with force. In other words, it was strategic. It was the brains over brawn. It was a strategy against brute force. And that's a recurring theme in lots of stories in martial arts. I don't think there's any myths. If there's a myth where there's a, a small weak person and a big tough guy comes in and beats them up and uh, kills them, that's not going to be a very popular myth. That's not going to be told through the centuries. It doesn't really have a greater lesson. It doesn't have a greater meaning. Um, so why, why do we celebrate these stories where there's the smaller beating the larger? What's that about? Because, you know, in life, there's lots of things bigger than us. There's lots of uh, challenges. So the idea is we can, um, we can position ourselves. We can orient ourselves. This is the idea of the footwork in the Lama style. The, the idea of uh, strategically placing ourselves where we can align our force and whatever's the adversary can't reach us. That's a lesson. The other lesson is both the story of... Um, David and Goliath and of the, the white crane ended with the taking of the eye. So that's also very, very symbolic. First, because it means accuracy. My teacher always in China always used to say, Deng Siva says that accuracy is more important than power. 
So if we're fighting and, you know, and my punches are not landing on areas that are going to do damage, it's not going to be as effective as I can be accurate. So it's the idea of accurate. And the idea of the eye being the sort of the where you're aiming and where you're seeing. So if you're, you're taking your opponent's eye, um, it's a bit gruesome, I know, but the idea is that you're, you're taking away their ability to see, to orient themselves. So you have to be accurate. You have to be brave. That's another thing. Uh, in Cantonese, they say, Yat da mi lik san gong fu. means the first thing, dam means, literally it means gallbladder, but it's in Chinese it means like guts. We would say first is guts, second is power, third is technique. So if you don't have bravery, you're not going to stand in front of somebody bigger and stronger. Um, even if you have the technique, it's not going to be any use without bravery. So there's another lesson there. Fight for something you believe in, something that means something to you. Be brave. Don't just fight force with force, but orient yourself. Find a way, find a position where you can maximize your force and then direct your force to your opponent's weak area. So lots of ideas in that story. And uh, it's a nice story. If, whether or not it's historically true is kind of immaterial. There's lessons to be learned from it. You can think about that. You can meditate on that. And just bringing that kind of feeling into your practice um, has a very different sense if you're practicing with it, with the, with the feeling, with the feeling of say protecting your nest or or so forth. So it has multiple layers of meaning, which I think are useful, useful for martial arts. And sure, let's get history, let's get science, let's get sports science. This is all good, but let's not throw away some of these stories. Okay, give you another example. Um, when I was in China in '91, I bought a book which was uh, the myths of the Shaolin Temple. And there was a, well, most of the stories kind of are similar in that somebody's bullied or gets uh, oppressed and goes to the temple and learns some special methods and comes back and gets revenge and it's, it's, it's the old story. One of the stories was a boy goes to the temple and he's given uh, a very young calf and they plant a sapling into the ground and they say, hold on the, to the calf and jump over this sapling a hundred times a day. And that's his only instruction. He's not taught anything else. Strange, so he holds the calf, jumps over the sapling. Well, imagine, the calf gets bigger, the sapling grows. Three years later, he's holding onto a cow and he's jumping over a tree, right? So we can laugh at that now, because we can say, well, the real world doesn't quite work that way. That's a silly story. But is it a silly story? Let's look at maybe what, what's that meant to teach you? What does that mean? Well, you have to realize that the concept of progressive resistance it, in the West is only since the late 19th century. Before then, people didn't even have the concept that if I pick up something that's heavy and I do it every day, after a while it's not heavy anymore. And then I can pick up something slightly heavier and if I rinse and repeat and do that in love, I'm going to make progress, I'm going to get stronger. It's common sense to us now, but at the time of that legend, people really didn't understand that. Um, so you have that idea that you can by challenging yourself and by making the increments very, very small. So the, the cow isn't going to get bigger from one day to the next. The tree's not going to get bigger from one day to the next. But if you come back a few months later, a few years later, it's a huge difference. And that's a really important lesson. We practice every day, whether we feel like it or not. Sometimes progress seems like a cruel. Uh, but you look back over a few months, you say, oh, no, I have. I've made progress. And having that kind of long-term vision and keep repeating and doing something every day is an important lesson. Okay, modern sports science has come a long way. We know that if you were to take a sapling and a cow, yeah, you get stronger and for a point, up to a point, and then you'd probably kill yourself or injure yourself. So that we have a more sophisticated understanding now. We, we, for example, modern sports science would say you would do that for a cycle, well, not maybe with a cow, but you would uh, increase the weights and the, the height of the jump, and then you, there would be a point where you'd plateau and then you would deload, you would need to rest the body, and then you would repeat it, and you would peak again, and the second peak would be slightly higher than the first peak, and the third slightly higher than the second, until you reached what would be your, what we now understand to be your genetic potential, which typically may take eight to 10 years to, for your body to reach that full potential. And that doesn't matter whether it's in sprinting, or weightlifting, or fighting, or whatever. It's that kind of, that kind of time scale. So some people might say, well, if it's genetic, I mean, it's a fair genetic component, what's the point, you know, is, is it really, um, does it mean anything for someone to be stronger or faster? Is it just, just, if it's just genetics? Well, the fact is that the genes need to be switched on and that we, most people are so far from their potential that even if you're in a room and your, your genetic potential is one of the lowest, if you're training like that every day and you're reaching your potential, you're still going to be stronger than most other people simply because they're nowhere near their potential. So that, that's an important lesson. So what's that story teach people? First of all, the idea of perseverance practicing every day. Second, the idea of um, incremental increase. Okay, so as far as it goes, it's a good story. I mean, I wouldn't take that as the basis of my training program, 
But then again, you know, if you get a training program, a modern scientific training program, it maybe is not, unless it's someone who's been training a long time and is a bit of a sports science geek and really, really into that stuff, like now I'll see a new program and I'll, yeah, I'm really, really interested. But as, as a child, um, you hear such a, you see a program like that, it's not going to inspire you. You hear the story, you maybe, you, 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 you know, your father or your seafood teaches you a, the story of the, the, the boy and jumping and the cow and it's a lesson, it's a life lesson, it goes in your subconscious and you say, right, I'm going to practice, I'm going to improve. It can be inspiring. So that's the other use of these stories, is that they emotionally engage us. You see, the, the pure history or the pure facts of the science might be more correct or more true, but uh, we need something to emotionally engage with to motivate us to do our practice, because Kung Fu is years and years of refinement and, and work, so we need something that keeps us going. So these stories can inspire us, can entertain us, and can be passed on to the next generation, because they encode the values of the style, the values of the system, not just the physical techniques. So I think the... Uh, in, in, in China, they say man mo seng chin, which is like the, the, the civil or the cultural and the martial art have to be uh, together. The, the so-called scholar warrior um, ideal. So it's something that I believe in very strongly. Anyway, that's me rattling on for some time. Um, if you found this useful, if you found this interesting, uh, please comment, like, share, um, drop any messages, anything you want me to talk about, uh, I'd be happy to discuss. Also, I'll be filming. I've got some um, new video equipment, some better quality equipment. I'm going to be doing some new filming. I'll be doing some online courses, and there'll be some free courses dropping within the next couple of weeks as well, Kung Fu and Tai Chi. So keep your eyes open. And, um, yeah, watch this space, and peace. I hope you all have, enjoy your training. Have a good day.